What's up guys, Tom Fazio here, doing a, a bit of a series of sorts uh, in anticipation of my new book, Law of the Die, that is largely dealing with the topic of randomness um, and how we might design good luck in life. Some pretty fun shit. If you're new to the channel, I tend to focus a lot on uh, mind-body development stuff. I've got a mind-body method called weightlessness. It's the bee's knees and uh, I do a bit of martial arts. So a lot of the content will generally be geared toward those, those things. Um, but this is an extension of those. And there are kind of a series of, of thought problems and cognitive biases that I try to address with the book. Uh, and so the book is fiction, but it's thoughtful fiction. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Uh, and in the appendix, and there's some free resources on my website, uh, that try to break down some of the issues with, I guess we could call predictive modeling, right? So our ability to predict the future, our ability to understand complex scenarios and uh, and circumstances and, and try to formulate some kind of a, a meaningful narrative around them, such as life, such as business, such as religion, that's what all these things are trying to do, uh, and often failing for us. And so the, the proposition that I have with the coming book is, well, I don't think we can predict the future, and reason often fails us, so perhaps it's better if we just throw caution to the wind, put some skin in the game, and roll the dice. Um, yeah, so the topic of this video is going to be about, uh, well, I'm ca I call it the software problem. This is a fun one for me. I think this is a really interesting uh, thought problem. I think it's extremely important in the personal growth and development game and it's almost never addressed. Um, so I'm going to address it here for us. So you got your computer. You got your hardware. That machine that uh, comes out of the box when you purchase it from the store. Uh, and then you got the software. All the junk you load onto it that helps you navigate your world on the internet, right? So if we were to, to, to extend that analogy to your life, we might call your hardware mind and body assets, mind and body pillars, right? So in, in weightlessness and in law of the die, I dissect this problem uh, and I talk about four key pillars, at least within weightlessness, right? There's nutrition, strength, flexibility, meditation. Each of these has a progressive spectra, uh, spectrum unto their own. Uh, they're pretty complex domains, and most of the mind-body arts and most of the arts out there tend to focus only on one, maybe two. Weightlessness does cover all four in a way that is holistic, integrative, and progressive. Super smart shit. You should check it out. Um, but we could say that these things are addressing your hardware, right? The stuff that goes into every single engagement, experience, situation, relationship. If I have a conversation with my partner in life, it's the same mind and body that, that sh is showing up for work. It's the same mind and body that's showing up to the gym, right? And so these are, these are our faculties and our resources that allow us to excel in the real world. Now the problem uh, or the issue comes when we assume that that's all there is and then we approach circumstances and scenarios that exceed our capacities. Um, yeah, at least that's an issue in weightlessness. I mean, look, weightlessness addresses one of those things, the mind-body domain, in a way that I, I don't think is often addressed, and so it does resolve some of these problems. Most people don't pay careful enough attention to the mind-body dynamic, meaning most people are looking for software inputs, right? How do I get better at doing that thing at work? How do I get better at managing relationships? How do I get better at playing golf? How do I get better at name your life scenario thing, right? These are software inputs. So being a better golfer does not necessarily make you a better father unless you're elite, right? You, if something starts to become your craft, you're hitting a level of depth, introspection, and awareness around that craft that generally will transfer to other things in life, right? Um, and so that's a point where we might begin to look at that as being hardware development accidentally. But until then, these things tend to be very um, isolated in nature, and they don't transfer very well. On the other hand, mind and body tools 
and capacities do transfer very well to most scenarios in life. Increasing your awareness or increasing your concentration is not a localized skill. It improves every conversation, every experience you have across the board, period. Having more stamina, having more resilience, having more fortitude, some of the things cultivated through physical training in the gym, these are not just localized gym attributes, right? These things transfer to all facets of life as well. So that's, that's how we can start to think about these. These are different worlds and they don't transfer very well. So it's not just the tools that don't transfer well. Some of the strategies that we use to develop them also don't transfer very well. So what do I mean by that? So we might consider the mind-body domain a closed domain in a way, like a, a closed kind of a static domain. Is it absolutely static, absolutely closed? No, because we've got environmental feedback, nutrition is a form of, of kind of an external being taken into the body. There are a ton of variables in nutrition. It's unbelievably complex. We're, we are so far from understanding it. It's not even funny. Um, good luck to those who try. But in general, when I work with clients, I know very to a very high degree what types of stressors are required in the gym, in meditation, in nutrition to elicit certain types of transformative effects to a high degree, right? Is it absolute? No. There are tons of variables, but, but your mind and body dynamic is closer to that of an engine. For somebody that's really uh, experienced in the mind of personal growth and development, it's closer, to that of an, it's closer to an engine than it is to comparing it to something that's an open and dynamic domain like love, business, uh, fighting, like self-defense, life in general, right? Those are domains that are incredibly complex, ones for which there is no true preparation for them. You could take the best in, in show, the, you know, the most competent people in each of those domains, the best fighters can lose, the best lovers can get their hearts broken, uh, and you know the best, what, what did I just mention? The best businessmen can produce a dog and, and have a shit business that comes out of nothing, right? So there, there is no way of mastering those domains. You can get good, you can develop a lot of the skills, but again, these are, these are software skills that don't necessarily apply 100% of the time. So my conversation uh, with The Essence of Lightness and, and In Pursuit of Weightlessness, my first two books, was largely looking at the hardware equation, right? Which is to say, well, look, uncertainty is real. We don't know the types of things that we're gonna have to face in life. The best thing that we can all do as a starting point is address the constants. The constants, your mind and your body, the things that you bring into all facets of life, the things that will absolutely deteriorate and collapse when you start to face real uncertainty and volatility in life. If somebody in your family dies, if you lose the love of your life, if you get fired from work unexpectedly, these are things that shatter your narrative uh, and your sense of purpose in the world, your sense of meaning in the world, in a way that are they're just very difficult, right? Uh, you know, rapid poverty, losing money. I mean, all these things are, can be devastating to a mind and a body not prepared for that type of volatility. Um, but these types of things, you know, the, the, this conversation stops at the mind-body, at the hardware question. It doesn't really transfer over into the software question. And I talked about this a little bit in the last video dealing with uncertainty, uh, sorry, uh, the Boulder problem, which talked about Sisyphus and how there are two aspects of the Sisyphusian dilemma. There's his interpretation of his plight. You know, he's condemned to an attorney of rolling a boulder up and down a hill. How he perceives the boulder, how he responds to his plight, how he chooses whether misery or potential, uh, you know, insight and in life and meaning despite the monotonous mediocrity. But the other side of it is the boulder. And, you know, maybe he can crush that shit and create a new world for himself. He can't do that in the myth. Uh, but we all have, you know, plights and obstacles in our lives that we need to ask that about for ourselves. On one hand, we need to, to uh, look at the way that we respond to those things. Can we respond better to certain types of conflicts and problems? And how can we reorient and reframe problems? But the other side of it is, how do we crush the boulder? That's a software problem, right? That's something that is not just the way that you think about it and the way that you prepare for it, right? Law of attraction, people, I've got plenty of bones to pick with uh, that, that crowd. Law of attraction, people, will tell us that, well, you know, just 
you know, think positive things before you go to sleep and, uh, you know, rewire your neuro, your rewire your, uh, your neurology and, and, uh, you know, directly affect your neurochemistry so that you start to manifest positive things in your life. And well, I think up to a point, this is fine. And there, there is a lot of legitimate science behind altering and affecting your own perceptions and the way that you interact with the world. But if you start to extend this into the underlying substrat of reality into metaphysics, you're taking massive leaps and assumptions that I don't think there's any scientific foundation for yet. Uh, so I've got problems with it. Right, so the software uh, problem is a complex one. Because if we're not dealing with a closed, small domain, like if you're not dealing with a craft specifically, if you're not a mechanic or a mathematician or somebody that has a high, high degree of correlation between inputs and outputs and predictive accuracy, and you're trying to deal with stuff, let's just talk about life at large, you're deluding yourself if you think that you're going to be able to create models and assumptions and, and roadmaps for yourself that last, you know, beyond a few months, even, even that long, right? If I'm going to have, this is what the next five years, the next 10 years of my life are going to look like. Some people get lucky. So I'm going to address this in another video called the delusion problem. Uh, and some people get lucky, right? But the problem that most of us make is that we look at a few of the winners and we say, well, therefore, um, the approach makes sense. And we are not looking at the, probab the probability of success, right? It might put a million people in the graveyard of losers and one person wins because of circumstance and people are like, oh, so it's possible. Sure. But the way that I'm approaching this and with the law of the die, it's like, well, how do, we, how do we load the die? How do we stack the deck? How do we make sure that we're playing a game for which we have a higher probability of success? And this is a difficult thing to address in most aspects of the software problem. Um, because we can't predict the future. Again, we've talked about that in the uncertainty problem. And so creating concrete roadmaps and objectives is very difficult if you're in a volatile, if you're in a volatile domain, and most things in life that are important are volatile: business, life, love, survival, et cetera, et cetera. So, with law of the die, I propose an alternative, which is that well, <laughs> perhaps we just need a catalyst to doing more shit, right? We don't know how the positive things in our lives came to us. We don't know how the ones in the future are probably going to come to us, but we do know that by being in certain types of situations, meeting certain types of people being exposed to certain types of situations, circumstances, etc., good shit happens. So my question is, well, how do we just increase the rate of exposure to those things? Because we don't know, right? We might have done 50 things and maybe two of them paid off. And a lot of us think we're super genius and said, oh, it's because I did that thing that this thing happened. Well, sure, but it might not have. And it's possible one of the other 50, uh, you know, efforts could have paid off. And I think that the problem for most of us is not so much that we're not choosing the right things. It's that most of the things that work out are not really predictive. They're largely random. So to get back to software, uh, the die in the book and, and you know, for our, our purposes here, the question is, well, how can we produce more randomness in life, exposure to random things for the purposes of solving problems, crushing the boulder, bypassing any issues or problems in life. Because while we can reorient, while we can try to apply our reason and our insight in a variety of circumstances, it's possible that you are suffering now because you just don't have better options. It's possible you've been stuck in a dead end, end job for two years because it's your only job, right? Well, what if you had 10 other, you know, name your level in a company, but 10 other employment offers like literally calling you today and the salary was on par or better than what you're being offered, immediately you would have a totally different perception of your experience and, and, and a totally different perception of your plight, right? Let's say you're in a relationship that's been weighing you down for the last year. Well, if you had 10 suitable partners, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever it is, literally knocking on your door, your perception of the conflicts of that problem would not be the same as they would otherwise. And so while I make the case in the book that not all problems are, are probably ideally suited for this type of an approach, we can easily see how a lot of the things in our lives 
are holding us, the problems and obstacles are holding us back because of the perception of limited options. And so what if we could just iterate more options, create more possibilities, create more options, not necessarily knowing how everything would pay off, but looking at a direction, looking at a domain and saying, how do I increase my options and opportunities in those domains? And I'm not expecting any specific results, I'm just saying, increase the options, increase the number of options, do it today, roll the dice, take a chance. So guys, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed a little bit of that rant today on uh, the software problem. I think it's fun stuff. We'd love to hear your thoughts about it in, uh, in the comments below. Uh, again, this is part of a, a little bit of a larger series on thought problems that are underlying my, uh, my coming book, my book, uh, Law of the Die. If you want to be part of that launch in some way, I've got some details below in the description. Very cool shit. Fun stuff to talk about. Uh, and there are other ways of engaging that as well through the website. Um, but it deals with what I think is a big issue, big challenge for us all, which is lifestyle design. How do we overcome problems, crush obstacles? crush life, feel amazing, feel weightless. And it's a complex problem. And so this is my attempt at dissecting that issue a little bit and uh, having a conversation. So yeah, guys, until the next time, I've got a few more of these problems uh, coming up for you, thought problems. And until then, be weightless, like, subscribe, all that fun jazz, and uh, catch you in the next one.